Um, so I want to begin by um, uh, talking to you a little bit today about um, public transit in Toronto, the Toronto Transit Commissioner, the TTC. And for those of you who don't know, um, the TTC is the public agency in Toronto um, that's responsible for providing pub, uh, public transit for people in and around the city. Um, so the TTC was formed in 1921 out of a desire to get private ownership out of uh, public uh, transit services. Um, it was formed as the Toronto Transportation Commission and later renamed the Toronto Transit Commission. In 1962, the TTC was taken over by the municipality of Metropolitan Toronto, um, which is the level of government that preceded the city of Toronto um, before the city of Toronto, which became an entity in the mid 1990s uh, took over um, its operation. So this research that I'm doing is part of some of the broader work I'm doing uh, on the TTC for my dissertation. And I focus on a number of TTC annual reports in this paper from 1941, 1943, 1960 to 2018. Um, 1941 and 1943 are individually highlighted because they were reports I was able to procure during the pandemic. The rest of the reports from 1960 to 2018 um, were ones that are easily accessible on the Toronto Transit Commission's website. Now, I bet you're thinking, oh joy, he's gonna talk to us about annual reports. This is going to be so amazing. Well, let me tell you, it's far more interesting than you think it is. So annual reports such as the ones that I'm gonna to talk to you about today are divided into sort of two parts. Um, one is, or part of it deals with comments from the, the commission chair and part of it comes, or part of the comments come from the chief general manager or CEO, uh, chief executive officer, as they are named later on. And the second half of these documents include financial statements, which become increasingly unreadable for the average person over time. Um, I've, it's interesting, but uh, to talk more about this, but um, obviously there won't be much time to get into that right now. So. The written parts of the annual reports are written to city councils and as such they tend to have or at least they highlight a managerial perspective and a very particular representation of the organization. And the portraits painted by these perspectives are performances in themselves as they highlight certain things over others. And in doing so they give us things to think about in terms of the realities that are constructed and how the organizations are seen by those in charge. And this is, of course, aside from the histories they detail and how they highlight how the organization is funded. So my focus was on the description of the organization on the whole by these public figures and the descriptive accounts rather than the financial statements. And thinking about managerial portraits in this way is important because it has consequences for how we think about public service work. Those who do the work of public service and those who are served by that work. It allows us to think through the implications of managerial portraits because of the dominant positions they hold in organizations. So my, my approach in this uh, paper employs an ethnographic sensibility. And you know, ethnography isn't just about um, you know, employing participant observation within a particular community, but it can be an approach that you know, um, takes on various sorts of data and thinks through the various social relations interactions between people and focuses on the perspectives of the people who are being studied. And looking at managerial ways of seeing unlocks how these members of their social world see and understand their community or social world. So to unpack my findings, I use two concepts, representation and truth. And representation as a concept was popularized by cultural critic Stuart Hall, who subverts the old way of, of thinking about representation. Um, that representations are merely stand-ins or representations of reality. And rather what Hall tries to do is to get us to think about how representations structure reality, how they're actually making up the world we get to see and know and experience. Ruth Hines puts it differently and in very nice terms, I think, when she says, you know, quote, we create a picture of an organization and on the basis of that picture, people think and act. And by responding to that picture of reality, they make it so. Unquote. The concept of truth from historian Michel Foucault is also important. For him, truth is to be understood as a system of ordered procedures for the production, regulation, distribution, circulation, and operation of statements. And we can think of it as the production of knowledge that's circulated, 
which distinguishes that which is true from those things that aren't through, for example, setting norms or through omission. And through truth, certain forms of action become permissible as they legitimize certain ways of knowing the world or particular phenomena. So let's get talking about these annual reports, okay? As I move forward, there are two things I'm gonna focus on today, how users are described and how the organization is viewed by those who are in charge. So consequently, we can gain a sense about the user base um, when we think about uh, this in terms of context, um, as well as through the visions of the organization. Um, and also one of the things that I will get to at the end of this presentation is to think through sort of the consequences for work and labor through an analysis of these findings. And I think those of us who are familiar with the TTC will probably remember the days of CEO Andy Byford, and probably pretty fondly. Um, and in fact, under his leadership, uh, the TTC's ridership was at its peak. Um, and he was the organization CEO uh, during the tenure of the infamous mayor, Rob Ford, and the early part of John Tory's mayor, mayorship. Now, Byford was promoted um, after Mayor Ford um, and his supporters thought it necessary to dismiss then Chief General Manager Gary Webster. And Byford brought with him an extreme focus on customer service. As you can see in this quote, um, and before, actually, before I get to that, you know, one of the things that brought this focus into view was that the TTC was often in the press for having bad transit professionals doing bad things. Um, sleeping on the job was probably the one that uh, was most iconic. Um, now, Byford also reorganized the TTC, and most notably, he changed you know, the title of the chief general manager to chief executive officer. And in 2015, in an annual report, he states, quote, Behind the scenes, we've continued our quiet but determined modernization of all aspects of our organization, tackling deep-seated cultural issues that have impeded good customer service, transforming processes to make them customer-led, and generalizing, generally professionalizing the way we do business. And what's interesting here is the focus that's placed on customers and his idea of customer service. And it's interesting to note the use of language that talks about TTC doing business. Now, to the, to me, this appears as a signal suggesting links with private sector industry discourse and how a public agency comes to or is um, geared to view itself and how it views those whom it serves, its customers. Now, preceding this, in the, in the mid-90s, the TTC was focused on something called state of good repair, and this had to do with making sure service operation was functional and reliable. In 1997, where one of the annual reports where no customers are discussed, and this was at the height of the populist right-wing Mike Harris common sense revolution. The TTC annual report indicates that, you know, quote, the backbone of the TTC continues to be its maintenance of good repair, unquote. And here the TTC, a cash-strapped public agency, which indicated as much in its annual reports, doesn't mention customers, is more focused on making sure its fleet is operational. In 1998, Chief General Manager David Gunn is highlighted as being as someone who, is, who, is, who brought in technically minded managerial staff to make gains for quote unquote customers. Now this maximization of the language of the customer or the user isn't really a new thing. For example, if we were to look back in the 1990s, the TT was, TTC was talking about something similar. Take for instance, this passage from 1992, um, on customer service. And this is at the, you know, at the height of Bob Ray's um, uh, left-leaning NDP provincial government. Um, and also, you know, the social contract, which appears right around this time as well. Quote, in 1992, customer service remained the basis of the TTC's success and the emphasis placed upon it was, had never wavered. TTC employees worked hard to maintain an efficient, effective transit system with the goal to be Metro's transportation method of choice. And what's also interesting is this annual report notes how total quality management or TQM, a theory which DeGay and Salomon describe as quote, requiring a, or requiring a quote, redefinition of the relationship between workers in terms of the customer model, workers become each other's customers, unquote, and is predicated on the idea that pressure to satisfy the customer, whether imagined or otherwise, will create pressure to improve quality. Um, this is something that's discussed in this annual report as well. And all of this, of course, you know, is interesting to think about because the, the, the TTC at this time is forced to make concessions as the social contract is approaching. Um, wages have to go down by 
um, staff cuts were being made. So in the early 1990s, you can see that, you know, there is a recessionary impact, but nonetheless, we're back to talking about customer service yet again. Now, only a few years before this time, it's inter interesting to note how discussion about the customer fizzles out. In 1981, the annual report indicates that the TTC did a quote unquote public attitude survey, which is interesting because it's not a customer survey, right? And in the same year, the report indicates how the TTC waged a quote unquote extensive marketing campaign to stimulate demand for service. And after all, as the report suggests, reaction to the cost of a car at the time made people see transit as an alternative. Now, much of the discussion of customers ebbs and flows throughout the years. The first appearance of it comes in 1967. So the, cus so the customer in these discussions is actually not new at all. Um, in 1965, we returned to thinking about the quality of the equipment, quote, the commission's continuing program to maintain high fleet standards and to provide the best equ available equipment for its riders. And quote, the commission would also like to thank its riders who by their respect for their transit systems, property and equipment have helped to earn for Toronto a worldwide reputation for cleanliness and good maintenance, unquote. And perhaps again, there's this focus again on making sure that service is reliable. Now the TTC in the 1960s, its discussion about its state of affairs overall tends to be more candid, talking about how it requires more funding and how it can, or how it requires funding um, and how it can't continue to run a deficit. And what's interesting is that the TTC has never been shy about talking about being cash trapped, but it's always been more direct in the 1960s. And it's important to note that early on, the TTC was actually self-financed. 96% of revenues came from passenger fares. Um, it didn't get actually money from um, other levels of government, except for um, some grants for um, capital. To, to, to expand the, the, the transit uh, system's capital. Um, and the organization highlighted how its expansion into suburban Toronto also created a financial strain. Now it's interesting to think about how the organization for so long had been self-financed and how in this recent era, it requires a public subsidy in order to maintain service, either that or fare increases. And in many ways, it's a reminder that, you know, Things might stay the same in many ways, but they do evolve as well. Now, what's interesting to note is that from the 1940s reports, there's an indication of the TTC um, focus on high standards of service and how it sought uh, to offer those high standards. Now, the content of that quality of service, what that content of the quality of service means in the end seems to shift. You know, focus on high quality service could mean reliability, state of good repair. It could mean a customer focus, or it could mean really all of that. I mean, management also saw the organization as having an excellent reputation. In 1963, the TTC commissioners thanked, quote, the capable and conscientious staff as, quote, responsible for the TTC's reputation as one of the finest transit systems, unquote. And if you're a Torontonian, you probably will find such a comment seeming to be outrageous, right? Um, but keep in mind that the organization had a global consultancy uh, wing up until the 1990s. And keep in mind when CEO Andy Byford took charge in the 2010s, he was interested in restoring that reputation. So through reading these annual reports, we can see how the managerial portraits represent and construct the organization and its users and how we can silently have consequences for staff. After all, if something isn't going right, who pays for the problem? Probably transit staff, right? And I think in the end, when we think through this idea of serving the customer in terms of the organization's desire to provide high levels of service, something that's echoed in its corporate philosophy of ser service, safety, and courtesy. These different ways of doing so from customer-centric approaches, total quality management, state of good repair, in different ways are highlighting different modalities or techniques of high level of service, swinging in a Polanyian pendulum through the years. The attempt to satisfy the different pressures that the service must endure. They also construct particular realities and attempt to solve those constructed truths. In employing these various techniques, we have to ask, what does it mean for those who are providing the service on the front lines day to day? And as I've indicated elsewhere, the customer centric approach can bring with it a heightened awareness and surveillance of frontline staff, creating another layer of ubiquitous management. But in other ways, it can highlight how those different modalities of focusing on the user create creative possibilities for recognition of the importance of public labor. For example, when customer feedback 
was solicited with the customer service advisory panel on the TTC in 2010, it didn't become a move to trash staff, right? If you look clearly in parts of the document, for example, there was an acknowledgement of the extreme role that bus operators are forced to play when driving a bus. Driving a bus is more than driving a bus. When customer feedback was solicited through customer service hotlines, while complaints went up, so did customer commendations. So as such, if dominating managerial truths um, and representation provide the terrain on which public labor must operate, Foucault's claim that, quote, we must, or that we must, quote, detach the power of truth from the forms of hegemony, social, economic, and cultural, unquote, become quite prescient. The future of public service and public labor must rest on, the, on those truth claims to look for openings within them, to restructure them, reclaim them, and re-envision them. And I've already mentioned a few of these, but we can also look to the types of advertising campaigns conducted by ATU Local 113, and that's the um, Transit Operators Union, to show the value of the work members uh, of members of showing how staff and members create cost savings through, for example, state of good repair projects and through actions that demonstrate, for example, both a respect for the customer through demands for better working conditions. Now, in the end, these annual reports don't give us answers for revolutionizing public labor, but they remind us like in Battlestar Galactica, all of this has happened before and all of this will happen again. By understanding the past, public labor can thrive in the interstices of managerial discourses, reclaiming them as their own. And there you are. Thanks, folks. <laughs>